So we're living in a time with a deficit of inspiration in my experience. There are plenty of people who can rant all day about the problems we're currently facing, but few are able to offer an inspiring vision for where humanity could focus ourselves. Many of us here are familiar with your integral theory, Ken, and experience the benefit of having meaning-making systems informed by quadrants, states, stages, and types to help us integrate parts of ourselves and have greater compassion for each other, as I was saying before. But while at the same time, it appears that nihilism and narcissism are only becoming more the norm. So from your perspective, what is an integral vision for our humanity that we can look to for, for inspiration and solace? Right, right. Well, if you look at uh, integral theory, uh, there are clearly uh, uh, a fair number of components to it. And you can look at those sort of as, as theoretical, you know, academic, uh, analytic elements that don't seem to have very much application to your world. But the more you look at what those are actually representing, they're pointing to very, very fundamental, very real aspects of items that you face every single day. And, and there's virtually no aspect of your life that isn't touched by some of these fundamental elements. Because these are elements that Integral didn't invent, but that we just simply find already out there running around. And the problem with how humanity is, has attempted to understand those various elements, at least up to fairly recently, is that it's tended to just sort of select one element as being the most important, the, the one that you really should master, and, and it kind of ignores all the others. And that turns out to be a disaster because these other elements have equally important aspects that apply directly to your own life, to your work, to your relationships, to your parenting, to your recreation, to your play, to um, your vocations and your avocations. Any of those items tend to be directly impacted by this. So you can look at it in a theoretical way. And you can say, okay, well, we learned that there are levels, and we learned that there are lines, and we learned there are quadrants, and, and all that kind of stuff. And that's one way to do it, and that's fine. And at some point, if you get serious about wanting to really sort of open your mind up to all these different aspects of reality that, that exist. And by the way, those aspects, when I talk about things like quadrants, or levels, or lines, or states, or types, I didn't invent any of those. Those, have, those are out there. They're entire communities of knowledge that study these things. There's an absolutely staggering amount of confirmation and evidence for every single one of the elements that I've presented. I mean, even if you just look at levels of development, for example, that's not just one or two or three theories came up with that. In the book Integral Psychology, I looked at over a hundred developmental models, all of them, and these are taken from pre-modern, modern, postmodern post times. They were taken from east and west, north and south. The evidence for those levels of development is overwhelming. The only thing that's startling about that is how almost absolutely unknown they are in this culture. Uh, you can even talk to us college professors, and they have no idea whatsoever that human beings and virtually all of their multiple intelligences grow and develop and unfold through a series of fluid, um, increasing stages or, or waves of development. And these are, are what you call growth hierarchies. They're not dominator hierarchies. Dominator hierarchies are all the horrible things that the postmodernists say about them. The higher you get in the dominator hierarchy, the more oppressive you can be, the more power you have, the more essentially rotten a soul you can become. And you meet your friends up there like Al Capone and Pol Pot and Stalin and Hitler and all those guys. 
Growth hierarchies are exactly the opposite. The higher you go in the growth hierarchy, the more inclusive you are. So in a typical growth hierarchy like Carol Gilligan's, you start, you just have a, a selfish care. And then at the next stage, you learn to expand that care to include a whole group or even groups of people. Now you care for them. If you keep going, you develop into a, a care for all groups, a world-centric universal care for everybody, regardless of race, color, sex, or creed. And so those kinds of developmental sequence are what we want. When we sit around and say, oh, we want to treat everybody fairly. Oh, we want to not be prejudiced. We don't want to be bigoted. Well, that's right. But by the way, you weren't born with those values. You weren't born thinking that way. You were born concerned with your own survival, with your own organism, and that's what you were identified with. Only as you got older and your consciousness and cognition and awareness began to grow that you started to expand your identity to care for more and more people. And then as you expanded into your closest groups, your family, your clan, your tribe, your nation, then you could continue growing into having a concern for all groups, for all humans, and not just your own special group, although you still care for that. But you also develop a care for all human beings, for all groups. And this, by the way, was a very, very recent development in humankind. We've been on this planet, human Homo sapiens sapiens have been on this planet. We used to think around 200,000 years, and of course they were precursors, Homo habilis and Homo erectus and all those. But the Homo sapiens sapiens, the modern human being, we used to think it was about 200,000 years old. Now the latest skeleton we found is about 300,000 years old. So as human Homo sapiens, we've been on this planet uh, about 300,000 years. Guess how long we had slavery in that 300,000 years? You think fairly soon we kind of realized that was not a nice way to treat a human being, wouldn't you? Yeah. 200,000 years? No. 250,000 years? No. 280,000 years? No. Nope only about 200 years ago that slavery was outlawed in every rational industrial nation on the face of the planet. 200 years. Even the great religions had slavery. Buddhist monasteries had slaves. Christian monasteries had slaves. St. Paul Council says, obey your master and love Jesus Christ. Really? That's what religion has to do for slavery? And it's because we didn't, we hadn't developed to this world-centric stage of development as a, as a widespread cultural organizing principle. A few people earlier had access to that, but not many, and certainly not enough to do anything about it. Peru had slavery until 1968. India had slavery until 1976. <laughs> Coming into this world century stance where we want to treat all people fairly, regardless of race, color, sex, or creed, is an extremely recent, rare achievement. And so when a uh, social justice advocate is sort of standing in front of universities screaming at the top of their voice, trying to shut out people that disagree with them and all that. And you say, what are your values? And they'll say, well, we want to treat all people fairly. You know, we don't want any white supremacists. We don't want any racists. We don't want any sexists. You go, right, that's a value structure that if you actually look at overall development, that actually took about four or five stages of development for you to get to those levels in the first place. 
So be aware of the fact that growth holarchies, not dominator hierarchies, but growth holarchies are something that's important. And so when you're taking something like an integral stance towards something, then that's one of the things that you're including in what you might call an integral sensibility. It's how you will interpret your moment-to-moment -moment experience and be able to make judgments about it. Is this the best way that I think this culture can be? Is this the best way that I can be? Is this the best way I can treat my family? Is it the best way they're treating me? And we can get these kinds of ideal understandings because we have a framework that tells us what's possible. If we had no idea that there were these developmental waves of unfolding, each one being more inclusive and more inclusive and more inclusive, we wouldn't know that we could even do that. And we'd end up the way humanity was for the past 300,000 years, uh, essentially fighting, brutalizing each other, getting into crusades, getting into um, Spanish inquisitions, getting into aggressive tribal warfare, um, a continual fight for one tribe dominating another tribe the fundamental rule of how you gained land was that you simply conquered and took it. And that was true around the world. Slavery existed around the world. The Muslim slave trade involved over 100 million slaves. Most of them, by the way, died because the male slaves were castrated. 100 million slaves compared to a couple million slaves that the Americas had. I'm not saying slavery in America was good, but I am saying we can't just blame one part of the world for slavery when there was much worse slavery occurring in many other parts of the world. In other words, slavery is simply bad, and you don't find it located in just one place on the planet. You find basically every culture in the world having that. So one of the things that, just in terms of hope and inspiration, one of the things that an integral model can do is say, OK, wait, here are areas that we can get better. And how do we know we can get better? Because we've done research on this. We have evidence on this. We've actually tested these things out. And we know they can happen. And then we can look back on history and see the ways in which, at least in some ways, things got better and better and better. And that's part of an overall evolutionary unfolding that seems to touch pretty much every area of the cosmos across the board. One of the things that this integral sensibility can give is a truly broad understanding. What the integral framework does, and again, that's just, there are the theoretical aspects of it, and I'm not talking about those so much, although as you look at those, it will help firm up some of the ideas that I'm talking about. But the general thing that an integral framework gives you it does give hope and inspiration because it shows you what is possible. It shows you the many ways that we can all make things better. And these aren't just pipe dreams and they aren't just theories. It's not like, let's say, Marx, bless his heart, sitting down and coming up with a theory about everybody, everybody was going to live better if they just followed a, a communist path of production and that would make everything better. And that was a wonderful, his heart was in the right place. He was working from a green stage of development. He was focusing on the lower right quadrant of material interactions. And every place that we put 
that version of communist, communism into action in the 20th century, it caused massive murders unlike anything we've seen anywhere in history. Alexander Solzhenitsyn estimates that the Gulag Archipelago murdered around 66 million people. That's far left, by the way, not far right. That's far left. Far right, we already saw, Hitler. Hitler killed about 13 million people. Seven million gypsies, gays, Catholics, disabled, etc., and about six million Jews. So 13 million for the far right, 66 million for the far left, and then Alexander Solzhenitsyn guessed that in Mao's Cultural Revolution, another far left, almost 100 million. So for far left, far left death toll, about 166 million, 20th century. Far right death toll, about 13 million. That doesn't mean one of them is worse than the other, uh, murdering anything more than one or two people is categorically <laughs> not a good thing. <laughs> so, so, so what we want is, okay, that can be made better. Those are our things that we can actually look at. And as we even think of those possibilities, we can get inspiration, we can get hope, and we can get a vision for our, for our own life. And part of what that will tend to do is, okay, you have this framework, so how does that guide a sensibility? And I want to just take a few minutes and give one example, because it's probably the single most dominant cultural trend that any of us are aware of right now, and that's the so-called culture wars. Now, you all know the culture wars, and you all have felt them, if in nothing other than the reaction to Donald Trump's presidency. That has triggered in quite violent, extreme, intense, in many cases sincere, reactions to, to what was perceived as, as a nightmare. And then, of course, you do have close to 50% of the population that thinks it was a really good thing. So how do you make sense of something like that other than simply picking a side and saying, OK, that's the side I'm on and I just hate the other side. I just can't even stand it. Let's, let's back up a bit and say, OK, wait, wait, let's just look at the overall picture and then let's see where your sentiments might lie in that. And we'll see if we can have some sort of integral sensibility that might help lead us through this absolutely extraordinary and vicious culture wars that we're going through right now. And by the way, they're getting so intense. There are serious social commentators saying that the United States is, is coming closer and closer to an actual civil war. That's how bad it is, okay? So where did this begin? The largest polarization that we find in the culture wars, although we find it across the board, Jonathan Haidt, for example, who's a brilliant moral psychologist uh, out, of, out of New York University, he studied the degree of polarization in this culture. And the um, degree of polarization he based on just a relative scale from zero to 20. Zero is nothing, 20 is horrible. And, here, and then here's all the polarizations he studied. And he went through all of the major sort of different polarized groups that we have. So he studied the polarization between male and female, rich and poor, black and white, and just those typical kinds of polarizations, including left and right, political differences. 
Well, what he found is that all of the differences in this culture, including between male and female, advantage and disadvantage, black and white, those all came in with a, a relative polarization of about anywhere from six to 10 points. And that can be fairly bad, but that was sort of the range that, that all of them fell into except one. The other one was political polarization, and it wasn't at six, seven, eight, nine, or 10. On a scale of 20, it was at 18. It was off the wall. The political polarization left and right has gotten so intense, that's one of the things that's driving the, the culture wars. And, and what we find with that is that even 20 years ago, if you ask a member of the left or a member of the right, what do you think about somebody in the other party? They would almost always say something like, well, I really do disagree with them, but I think their heart's in the right place. I think they're trying, but I think they're really confused. That's, nobody says that about the opposite belief anymore. Now you ask them, what do you think about somebody in the other party? And they say, they're demonic, they're evil, they're vicious, they're wrong. They're the worst thing that's ever happened. They have nothing in common with the other sides. That's a polarization that you can see why some people would say that could lead to civil war. There's no point of contact there. So clearly some sort of integral awareness is the only thing that's gonna help with something like that. It's getting that brutal. So it all started if you look at these political orientations, particularly ones like the left, it goes back around the 18th century. And in France, for example, you had a party that supported the way everything was. They supported the king or queen. They supported aristocracy and serfs. They supported the Catholic Church and all the traditional values that were in existence. They wanted things to say basically the same. So they wanted to conserve culture the way that it was. And hence, at some point, they became known as conservatives, um, sometimes also traditional values, which is how we often refer to them today. And they just happened to sit in the French assembly. They happened to sit in the right-hand seats of the assembly. So they were referred to as the right. And they were amber, ethnocentric, because that was the main leading edge at that time, except this is starting right around the Western Enlightenment, and there was a new stage of development emerging, namely the orange. Now, the orange was formal operational cognition. The orange was reason. The uh, Will and, a and Ariel Durant called this era the age of reason and revolution, and that's what it was. And so you had this newfangled orange group of folks that were against the previous amber group of folks. And where amber wanted everything to stay the same, supported the king, no problem with slavery, um, loved the Catholic Church and the dogmatic fundamentalist views of that, wanted to conserve all of that. The orange new political party which, by the way, called themselves liberal and then also progressive because they were looking towards the future. Whereas conservatives wanted to conserve the past, the liberals wanted to embrace the future and the new types of things that were starting to emerge. And so for a liberal, it wasn't just group rights and the Catholic Church is right and what the king says and right and all that. It was this radical thing called individual rights. And not only individual rights for just a particular group, but rights for everybody. And so all of a sudden, treatises called the universal rights of man started to appear. These have never appeared anywhere. Because if you were a fundamentalist Christian, for example, you don't think everybody else has universal rights. 
You can't imagine, if you're a real fundamentalist Christian, you can't imagine there's a Hindu in heaven. That's not going to work. Hindus can't get into heaven for Christ's sake. They haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. They're going to hell. Sorry, I love them. Don't hate you, but it's God's wish. You're dead. <laughs> this is, but all of a sudden, treatises, what the philosophes, the French, German, Scottish, uh, British philosophers of the Enlightenment started writing about was the universal rights of man. And yes, it did say man at the beginning because what they were doing was trying to think through from this new orange world-centric level, not the previous ethnocentric level where you get rights based on your special group that you belong to. Now you get rights not because you belong to a Catholic or because you're French or because you're German. You get rights because you are a human being, period. And everybody gets that. So the previous stage was, what's the best tribe? What tribe is in charge? What tribe has rights? What tribe is governing everything else? What tribe is controlling the whole culture and so on? Now, listen, with Orange World Centric, it's how do all tribes have equal rights? What do they all have in common? Not what do they all have differently. What do they all share in common? This is a radical change. And that's why this change in that 100 year period was the first time that we outlawed slavery. Because we actually looked at it and said, wait, did they, are they getting universal rights? No, they're property. They're being owned and tortured and beaten. That's not right. That was a staggering transformation that we went through, arguably the largest in humanity's history. Doesn't mean it didn't have downsides, it did. But that part of it was so absolutely extraordinary. So those were the liberals. They were pro progressive, looking to the future to bring in these new types of society where special groups weren't given privilege, but everybody was treated fairly, regardless of race, color, sex, or creed. Now what happened, of course, is that because the dominant culture of the time is the one that is simply in charge. So the dominant culture of the time happened to be white, able-bodied, usually propertyed, uh, white European male. And so those are the ones that, that, that make sure that all, they got all the equal rights applied to them. But the principle itself was from the orange level. It was a universal principle. And so that principle just kept getting applied to more and more and more tribes. So it went from just white European males to black folks. Then it went to women. Women got the right to vote and there was equality there. Then it went even into gays, and we got gay marriage. It's even into transgendered people now and giving them rights. And so those orange principles of the liberal Western Enlightenment is what kept being applied to make more and more and more people come under the tent of freedom and equality. And that's the values that most of us really, really cherish to this day. We'll get back to some of the problems about why it's hard to do that the, the way we approach it now. And we approach it non integrally so you can see where I'm going to maybe go with that. Um, all of that, those two main political orientations stayed the same for the next couple hundred years. And they showed up as the Whigs, or the Tories, or the Democrats, or the Republicans, or the conservatives, progressives, and so on. And then in the 1960s, we got a new major stage of development. Green started to emerge. In 1959, the percentage of the population in the United States that was green was 3%. By 1972, Jacques Derrida was the most frequently quoted academic writer in America. 
uh, green, pluralistic, uh, deconstructive, postmodern theories had completely taken over. And these were green. Now, here's where it started to get a little bit tricky. Because, well, by the time that that, let me see where my um, crude notes are. Um, by the time that um, Green emerged, it caused such a turmoil in the political parties because we only had two political parties, but now we actually three different types of value systems that somehow had to fit into the two. And so what happened was the Democrats, remember they had started it orange, original, liberal, universal rights and freedom for everybody. And the right, the conservatives, had started it amber, ethnocentric. They tended to be very uh, nationalistic, patriotic, uh, militaristic. They believed in fundamentalist religions, most of which were very patriarchal. Um, so they tended to a little bit of racism, a little bit of sexism. Some of them are very open about it, quite proud of it. But, but those, those two, traditional left and right, split. Each of them split into two sub-parties, simply trying to handle this new level. So what the Democrats did that started as the original left at orange and were liberal, they split. Half of them stayed at the old time liberal democratic values. Half of them moved up to the new green multicultural uh, identity politics stage. And this was very, very different really from the previous orange stage. And there started to be a lot of tension between those two views in the Democratic Party. And you can see that today, left and right. Um, there are very few Democrats now that will actually in, just come out and say, oh, I'm liberal. The green edge of the Democratic Party will often call itself post-liberal. And so where liberal was in favor of things, orange, original, Democrat, liberal, were in favor of things like free speech because they believed in freedom. Now, Green doesn't have any trouble oppressing or suppressing free speech. If you do any free speech that threatens to hurt the feelings of a minority, that free speech needs to be trashed. And there's efforts to do that all over the place, including even in Canada, Bill C-16 compels people to speak that way in terms of transgender. Um, that's a, that compelled speech is, has never ever once in all of English common law been put into place because it's a disaster to interrupt free speech in the way it does. But that's what Green wants to do. And the problem, the reason for that is that we've got amber that's ethnocentric, so it, it just favors its own particular group. It doesn't want everybody to be treated the same as it is. It's not going to let Hindus into heaven. It's not going to let Muslims into heaven. Anyway. So it's a little ethnocentric. <clears throat> um, but remember, everybody's born at square one. So you end up going through all these stages. There will always be people moving through egocentric and ethnocentric stages. So there will always be some group that wants to support those values. And a enlightened integral society will have to think of ways to accommodate that kind of situation. But when we then get up into orange, which was world-centric, and wanted freedom for everybody. And then Green w intensified world centric. And it wanted freedom so much that everybody got just an absolute guarantee of equality. So here was the two differences between the types of equality between orange and green. 
And this is part of the, va the battle that we see happening uh, the most now in terms of um, what's actually happening um, in the culture wars. So one of them, the two types of equality are referred to as equal opportunity and equal outcome. So if you have, let's say, an Olympic race, equal opportunity means absolutely everybody who's qualified to run that race gets a chance to run the race. So nobody's excluded because of race, color, sex, gender, creed, none of that. And if all that happens and everybody gets a fair chance to get up to the starting line, then Orange is happy. Orange says, okay, everybody is, has freedom. So, so that's what we've got now, and that's good. That's what Orange mostly wants, is that kind of freedom. That's how you get, you can get that freedom with an equal opportunity. So you get equal opportunity, you get everybody lined up at the finish line, you pull the gun, Whoever crosses the finish line first gets a gold medal. Whoever crosses second gets silver. Third gets bronze. That's equal opportunity. Equal outcome is not everybody gets to start the race at the same time, but everybody must finish the race at the same time. Now, that might sound a little silly, but <laughs> Keep in mind that things like certain little league, postmodern parents and teachers with little league games, baseball games, would actually hold games where nobody was a winner. And everybody who showed up got what was called a participation medal. In other words, everybody got a gold medal. So there are no winners and no losers. That's equal outcome. That's equality as far as green is concerned. Now, you can see that these two are very different. So equal opportunity is often called freedom. Equal outcome is often just called equality because everybody is sort of absolutely the same. So you have freedom and you have equality. Those are the two things that are diametrically opposed to each other. And I think it was Alex de Tocqueville who said that because human beings are born with different capacities, then you can have either freedom or equality, but you can't have both. And I think you can see that. They are diametrically opposed. And so orange and green are at each other's throats about these differences. And orange wants one, and green wants the other. And they don't like each other in terms of how they differ. So if you're looking at something like, um, let's say, um, if you um, are looking at the relation between men and women in society. And you want to see how fairly this is going on. Now, keep in mind that we're going to have these two differences between equality, whether we're going to, equality means that women are going to have free opportunity in every way to do everything men do, or whether we're going to know that because they're all going to have equal outcome. So if, for example, if one of the places that, that in education that women are upset, feminists in particular are upset, is they look at the number of men graduating in STEM sciences. STEM, S-T-E-M, means science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And men, there are more men graduating from those disciplines than there are women. And so for feminists, this means there's oppression because there's not equal outcome. It should be 50-50. And if it's not 
And that means something horrible has happened in terms of equal opportunity, that women aren't getting equal freedom to enter the educational system in STEM in the same way that men are. And so we need to do something about that because that's very, very unfair. So the question is, is that difference an equal outcome in the fact that there are more men doing this than there are women? Is that an indication of oppression? Now, according to Green, absolutely. That is completely unfair, and they're not going to be happy until it's 50-50. Equal number of women as men doing STEM professions. OK. As a little bit of background, let's back up and look at something like the Scandinavian countries. In Scandinavia, it's generally, it's universally regarded that the Scandinavian cultures have done more than any other countries on the face of the planet to try to get rid of sexism in their culture. And if you rank countries from just sort of the most sexist to the absolutely least sexist, most gender egalitarian, the top three or four are all Scandinavia. There's no question but that they have as, as little sexist depression as you can possibly get. So look at some of the professions that you find in Scandinavian countries and look at the ratio of men to women and, and see what you get. So where the prediction was that because there's so little sexism in culture that the number of men and women in the various professions would all start to become equal. And embarrassingly for the social constructivist theorists, the more sexually egalitarian a culture becomes, the greater the differences between men and women become. And, and this is just like exactly the opposite of what they thought would happen and what they wanted to happen. So if you look in the nursing profession, for example, the ratio of women to men is 20 to 1. It's just staggering. If you look, on the other hand, at a STEM profession like engineering, the ratio is also staggering. It's 20 to 1 here in favor of men. So 20 times more men than women are entering that STEM profession. And this is in a culture that has as little sexual oppression as, as has been able to be created so far. So we also find the same thing happening um, in American education. In 1970, nobody doubts that women were being oppressed in terms of their access to higher education. And so the percentage of men, the percentage of college degrees that were given out in 1970 61% of them went to men, and only 39% to women. So that's not an equal outcome, to put it mildly. And so we would say there was not an equality going on for women in higher education. And the conclusion was that because there wasn't equal opportunity, there wasn't an equal freedom for women to enter higher education in general. And so the United States put in play types of very aggressive measures to try and reverse that equal opportunity and make it more and more and more open for women. And after about three or four decades, it succeeded wildly. So today, for example, the percentage of college degrees being given to women is 61% of 
across the board. The percentage men are getting is only 39%. So interestingly, there's only one area where men still outnumber women. That's in the STEM professions. And those are the only ones that men outnumber women. And it's just three or four of them, as opposed to literally 20. There are more women in biology, psychology, psychotherapy, sociology, the humanities. There are more women becoming doctors. There are more women becoming lawyers. I mean, it's just overwhelming. And then down here, we've got the little STEM fields, and men are kind of holding out, and they're the one. And it's not only that men are doing that, it's that women just don't seem to want to. In the same way in Scandinavia, there just doesn't seem to be that much interest of women in doing engineering. They prefer helping professions, nursing or physicians or, or, or anything like that. And even in the, in the STEM fields, where the first S is science, men outnumber women only in sciences that deal with dead things like physics. As soon as you put a little life into the situation, like biology or psychology, women dominate those. So the question is, if this isn't oppression, which is the standard green response, is that all these, you know, there aren't more women in STEM because they're being oppressed, even though apparently they're not being oppressed in anything else. But we say, okay, it's oppression. But if it's not oppression, given that there's such a switch in, in the atmosphere in American higher education, and also given the whole results in the Scandinavian countries show the same thing. So if it's not oppression, what could it be? There have been several studies claiming to show differences between the male and female of our species. Some of them claim there's a difference in preferred sexual behavior pattern with men supposedly being more promiscuous. There are studies showing that men tend to excel slightly in mathematical abilities and women excel in verbal abilities and so on. So those um, um, Those may or may not turn out to be right. It, it, it seems like there is some, a fair amount of evidence supporting that. But there's one difference between men and women, that it's the largest difference. It's been measured in more different cultures with no exceptions ever being found. It lasts the whole lifetime of men and women. And it shows up literally starting on day one. And that difference is baby girls show much more interest in people and baby boys show much more interest in things. And so that difference doesn't even sound sexist. I mean, it's just, okay, fine, that's a difference. What does that mean? Well, for example, um, Interest in things, again, means dead, non-living, inanimate things like, oh, technology, engineering, um, mathematics, and again, science, but only if it's science of really dead things, living things that not, not quite. <clears throat> but so, so that's what men tend to find a little bit more interest in. Now, of course, there are... Tons of exceptions. You can always find women interested in STEM. You can always find men interested in helping professions. Um, these are just statistics. But again, it's the largest statistic that we can find. And it also would explain exactly what we see in Scandinavia. So what's the point? The point is that when we're looking at the culture wars and we're seeing these kinds of battles occurring, and we're seeing somebody from an extreme green point of view look at the differences between men and women in a particular area and find that there are more men than women. A typical green will automatically say that's oppression and they will not be happy until that equal outcome is 50-50. 
So even though women might have just a more natural interest in helping professions, in something like nursing, in doing something like being a physician, uh, in working with humanities and working with humans, is that something that is bad? Is that something we should try to stop because we don't have equal numbers between men and women here? Or is that something that's okay as long as we really do have equal opportunity? Now clearly we have to track both. Whenever you find one group, any sort of minority, that's doing consistently worse in crossing the finish line, even though everybody has an equal opportunity to get started, but during the course of the race, particular groups do not end up finishing first, then we have to be willing to look at a whole aqua integral spectrum of reasons that that could happen and not simply make an assumption just, oh, well, that's oppression or, oh, no, that's absolutely okay and there are no shades of gray in, in all of this stuff. That's, that, that's, um, that's part of the real problem. Now, the, the core of this, and I'm still sort of talking about um, the integral framework as just a sensibility that can give us a type of inspiration and a type of hope. One of the things we want to then say is, okay, well, why are these value structures of all pretty much worse than they've ever been, why are they at each other's throats so intensely? What is going on here? Why do they actually hate each other? Why are some social commentators saying we're this far away from an actual civil war? I mean, I, the, the worst time in, in recent American history that this kind of difficulty occurred was during the Vietnam War. Um, there were um, 400 burnings a year uh, in terms of protest and, and violent disagreement and what was going on. It was an ugly, difficult time. This, in some ways, is, is worse because it seems to permeate so much of people's lives and it, it drives people absolutely crazy. Um, it's a polarization, the likes of which we've almost never, ever been able to see. So what's going on and where are we getting this kind of polarization? One of the main places is that in part because of just reactions to Trump, but also just in part because of green is now the leading edge of cultural evolution. There's higher stages like second tier, but second tier is only about 5%. And the indications are that a, a, a stage becomes the leading edge when at least about 10% of the population reaches that. So we're not quite at integral being a leading edge. So the leading edge we do have is green, and there's 20, maybe 25% of the population at green, and that is the highest major stage um, right now. And so it is the, the leading edge of, of cultural evolution for us. And it has a extremely um, polarized and aggressive and in a certain sense unhealthy extremism that's tending to make it an incredibly bad exemplar of how the rest of culture should follow. Because that's what a leading edge does. It says, here's the way to proceed into the future. Here's the way that we can continue our own growth and development and evolution. And if that's broken, if that's dysfunctional, if that's headed in the wrong direction, then that entire message seeps down the whole rest 
of the cultural uh, unfolding. And that can be just truly um, a disaster. So one of the things that happens when you start to absolutize your point of view, when you start to make it the one and only possible view that you can have, and you, you hold it so tightly that you don't even feel you have to listen to alternatives. That becomes a disaster. Remember Claire Graves gave, the way he named these three stages that we're talking about, which are the three most recent stages that have emerged, amber, orange, and green. They're all still first tier, which means they're all gonna disagree with each other in any event. But the extremism of this has, is what's become so absolutely disastrous. Claire Graves called Amber the absolutistic stage. Because at Amber, at ethnocentric, you're identified with your special group. Your special group has the one and only true way to see things. The Bible, for example, or you could be Muslim, or you could be a Jewish fundamentalist. But the Bible is the absolute unerring word of God. And it is absolutely true, and there's no way to disagree with it. Uh, the Quran, followers of that believe the same thing. They believe not only that the Quran is the greatest spiritual statement made so far, they believe it's the greatest spiritual statement that can ever be made. That's about as absolutistic as you can get. And the problem is that you can be at a higher stage of development. You can be at orange or green or even teal or turquoise. And if you start absolutizing the way you view the world, if you start thinking this is the one and only way to see it, then your tendency is to regress to the absolutistic stage. That's where you start to feel good. That's where it starts to really feel like you're home. And the problem with the absolutistic amber stage, of course, is it's ethnocentric. And ethnocentric means tribal. Ethnocentric means doesn't want to see what its tribe has in common with all other tribes. It wants to see just what its tribe has that nobody else has, just how its tribe is different, just how its tribe should be treated special. And so when you regress to an amber absolutistic ethnocentric, tribalized stage, then that's the way culture itself starts to become. Tribalized, polarized, absolutistic, with no chance of dialogue. And so this can happen to orange, and this can happen to green. And unfortunately, we would hope something like that wouldn't happen from green, because it's the leading edge of our culture. It has been since the 60s. But with its identity politics, which means your reality is not based on you as an individual, it's based on your tribe. And you have to identify with your tribe and only your tribe. If you start identifying with other tribes, then you're betraying your tribe. You're doing something wrong. And that's just going to lead to oppression and nightmarish treatments for your tribe. So you pick your tribe, you stick to it, and you're different from all other tribes that there are. The problem, again, is that when you hold that absolutistically, you really do end up regressing. That identity politics means just your tribal identity. It doesn't mean a world-centric identity. It doesn't mean you inhabit a space where you try to treat all people fairly, regardless of race, color, sex, or creed. It means, no, you just pick whichever one of those you fundamentally are. You just pick your one race, and then you're different from all the other races. You pick your one sex, 
and you're different from all others. You pick your one gender. You pick your one creed. Those are what's real. Everybody else is what's wrong. That's the stance evolution fought so hard for 300,000 years to overcome. And that's what we're walking right back into. And we're celebrating it. We're saying, this is great. It's a disaster. We've seen history when it's governed by ethnocentric tribal orientations. For every one year of peace in humanity's history, there have been 13 years of war because of that stance. We've had crusades. We've had more murder, more torture, more brutality caused from one group of human beings on another due to, than to any other cause in our history. And we finally, finally, about 200 years ago, started to find ways to overcome that. We started to find democratic systems that had constitutions and said, we're here dedicated to the proposition that all human beings are created equal. And that that's how they have to be treated. And for us to start regressing back into that ethnocentric, my tribe versus your tribe, is to just repeat the disasters of human history. It's a nightmare. So what is, is something that we want to overcome that with? Clearly, the ultimate primary cure for something like that is to start a center of gravity that's at second tier. Second tier is the first stages in all of history that believe, well, as I said, preface that by saying all of the previous stages, all of first tier stages, think that their views and only their views are the one true ways to see things. But that's just how they naturally hold it. You can then get exaggerated, go to extreme forms, be absolutized, and regress to absolutistic stages, which makes it horribly worse. But the point is, first tier, each stage thinks that its way is the one true way. Starting second tier, and when researchers actually first started finding this, because it really only started to emerge on a widespread scale um, a few decades ago, but when researchers first started seeing this, they thought, wow, something is wrong here. This data is wrong. We're getting wrong results or something. Because people are saying that not that they've got the one and only best way, but that all the previous stages are somehow really important too. What? That doesn't make sense. I mean, it, we've never seen that before. But that's what second tier does. Uh, Claire Graves called Teal a universal donor. And that's like in, in blood. It's just one type of blood that can give blood to all types without a, a reaction. It's, it's a very rare uh, blood type that can do that. But that's what second tier does. It's a universal donor. It cares for all of the previous stages, if for no other reason then it, it intuitively understands that each one of those stages are necessary in an overall pattern of human growth and development. We need all of them. It's just like really atoms to molecules to cells to organisms. That's the large evolutionary sequence that we've seen since the Big Bang. If you took and destroyed all molecules, atoms would still exist but cells and organisms would die. So you can't just go back and, and just pull out uh, a stage because you think it's lower and then say it's not important and not give it any sort of significance. That's not an integral approach to 
all of these stages and what they mean and what an integral society is going to have to do. And that means a society whose leading edge center of gravity is coming from second tier, either teal or turquoise. And that's going to give a leading edge tone to the culture that says, make sure you truly are including and finding your place for each of these various value systems and the various stages of development that they go through as they emerge. Find ways to help that occur, but also find ways that if, if somebody is at a, a, a earlier, junior, ethnocentric stage, that they're not allowed to force their ways on culture at large. So it used to be if you were at an ethnocentric stage and you were in the Middle Ages, for example, and you found somebody was a witch, well, great, you had a public um, burning and you burned the witch at the stake and that was fun and everybody applauded and got a big kick out of it and that was great. Well, all of a sudden when world centric emerged, the first thing they did is said, okay, wait, sorry, you guys can't burn witches in the public sphere anymore. If you don't like them, fine, keep that to yourselves in your own house Think about burning them all you want. But when you come out here in our public sphere, no more witch burning. Not going to happen. So that still has to be kept in mind. There are still people at red and amber stages of development that would be just happy to burn the people that they disagree with. And particularly, again, I don't want to pick on them, but really extremely fundamentalist religious believers who think that there's just one God usually one book that explains that God, and they're the chosen people that have access to it, and everybody else is an unbeliever, is an apostate, is, a, a, is somebody who is bound for hell, and um, your job is to either convert them or murder them, frankly. Those are, are kind of the two choices. What Orange introduced was a notion of tolerance. And then intolerance for all people, again, regardless of race, color, sex, or creed. And it's, again, it's such a precious, rare achievement in humankind's history that we have to hold on to it with, with a, a very serious intent not to let something like that regress, because that's not good. So, in terms of, of just holding an integral sensibility and watching something like the culture wars, you're going to be able to get a sense of how holding this bigger picture about a picture that literally makes room for everything, everything, and finds a place that it can all fit in a decent, coherent way with dignity and respect and care and concern. That is not so much a theory that you hold in your head, although a lot of the things that you've looked at in terms of the theory have helped you get to the sensibility, but the sensibility is something that lives in your heart. It's because of the studying you've done and you found all these other areas that exist that human beings go through stages of, of growth and development to ever more inclusive stages that they do have quadrants that give these incredibly different ways of looking at the same thing, all of which are important, that we have multiple lines that govern where we can excel and where we, we do poorly and how we can improve. We have states, and big states are involved in something we call waking up, which is the one and only area that humanity has ever created that says there actually is an ultimate truth, and there is a way to directly experience it yourself. Not just a mythic story, and not just a story that claims that it's got the one and only true God, 
but a way that you can directly practice in your own awareness to have an immediate experience of this ultimate ground of being. And that is a profound life changer. And we also work with types. And when you see all of those areas, then that just simply expands your viewpoint, the capacity to take in more and more and more different people with different perspectives at different views at different places. That becomes an, an open, embracing, compassionate, even deeply loving attitude that you hold in your heart. And that's how you start approaching and living your life with that bigness of heart as something that is fundamentally ensconced in your being and makes you that much bigger, literally bigger. And that's something that is as inspiring and as hopeful as anything that I can think of. And so that's what I would recommend <laughs> for all of us. 